Okay, so I, as I should said, I'm a, a sociologist, so I'm going to start with um, something about borders from Georg Simmel, a sociologist, who says man is a bordering creature. He says we are bounded in every direction and we are bounded in no directions. Uh, and that's central to his um, notion of form and forms of association. And he says, the secret of the form lies in its being a limit or boundary. It is both the thing itself and that in which the thing terminates. That area in which the being and being no more of a thing are one. And this paper tries to think about that area, that activity of bordering, in which the being and the being no more of the thing are one, in relation to a very specific case, case that was discussed earlier, of what I call the disappearing plane, the Malaysia Airlines flight. Um, I'm going to move into that briefly. But I'm specifically interested in looking at the activity of bordering. And it's part of a, a broader project which is looking at the activity of bordering in terms of a claim that society is becoming topological. I'm going to move into the case, but before I do so, I want to warn you that the paper has many false endings which might be new beginnings, but depending on the time, there might only be one end, I guess. Well, I'll see whether I can do any of the full sentence, new beginnings. Okay, I'm going to start with a couple of images, which are really just to provoke um, in some ways. Uh, the first is this image, which is actually uh, historically inaccurate, but nevertheless familiar from at least my history book, of a ship falling off the edge of the world. So this is a very particular kind of border. It's an edge that you can fall off. The second image uh, shows how that edge is redefined as a horizon by hypothesizing a line of sight, a line of seeing between the seer and the scene. The next is an image uh, which shows a diagram which was devised to track the possible movements of Flight 370 once it lost contact with air traffic control. Um, and I think what's interesting here for me, I called it the boundless boundaries of the locally flat sphere. And I'm going to try and elucidate what I mean by these boundless boundaries uh, in the analysis that follows. But I think, first of all, what I want to argue is that what unites these images in, the, each of, in each of them, the making of borders, or boundaries, as edges or horizons, um, is understood in terms, for me, of a hypothesis of sight, of seeing or observation, and in which I will also go on to include sound as uh, a kind of hypothesis of sight of observation. And I want to look at the material infrastructure that makes possible these surfaces of visualization in which such hypotheses of sight, in which such kinds of boundary making can occur. More specifically, my argument is going to be that boundaries are made in hypotheses of sight as a function of the infrastructural organization of surfaces of visualization. And I give you an example that I think, I hope will make sense of this for you. First of all, it's to think about television and to think of how a surface emerges across the relations between the three sites of television, the place of recording, the place of reception, the place of transmission. 
So if you understand television in terms of this surface of visualization, its significance is not so much that it allows viewing from a distance, although of course that is important, but that it enables the boundaries of events to be drawn in new ways. Uh, this is just an image which maybe is familiar to you if you're an architect student of a building to do with uh, television broadcasting in, in China. So this is an argument that says that the specific surface potential, the inventive patterning of space-time that a surface affords, in this case, in the case of television, is what might help you understand what is called the liveness of television, uh, the eventful nature of television. And I want to argue that this, is, this kind of surface potential is being extended in the relations that are currently being established, as we've seen in many, many ways today, between GPS, the military, business, governments, and everyday users of location-based devices, sensors, and applications. So this is an argument about how the surface of the visualization that is emerging today is increasingly a function of algorithmic rules, complex functions of digital computation, which are able to produce boundaries, not only as edges that you fall off, or horizons, but as lines, folds, and limits, resulting in turn in multiple orders of observation with a whole variety of depths, intensities, neuroses, psychoses, and densities. But that's in a way to jump ahead of myself. The initial hypothesis about sight that I'm going to suggest is operative today and relevant to the case of the disappearing plane is what Heinz von Forster, who was one of the founders of cybernetics, describes in a discussion of cybernetics and circularity as double blind. A blind spot is a kind of obscuration of the visual field. Uh, and a particular blind spot uh, is recognized in medical literature as the place in the visual field that corresponds to the lack of light detecting photoreceptor cells on the optic disc of the retina where the optic nerve passes through the optic disc. And since there are no cells there to detect light, a part of the field of the vision is not perceived, the blind spot. And that's true in most mammals and most animals, although it's not true. I think the one on the right is from an octopus, <laughs> which I think is interesting and funny. Um, normally, in mammals and most animals, the brain interpolates the blind spot from one eye based on surrounding detail and information from the other eye. So the blind spot is not normally perceived. Importantly, for my argument, von Forster doesn't discuss the blind spot in the singular, but as the double blind. And he sums up the long-established finding that each of our two eyes has a blind spot with the aphorism, we do not see what we do not see. Or sometimes that's written up as we do not see that we do not see. What he's identifying is that having two eyes, we have two blind spots, but because we have two eyes, each interpolates to the other. We do not see what we do not see. And I would argue, this is referred to earlier, I think we live in a kind of era that's defined by a cultural imaginary of we do not see what we do not see, that we live in an era of total planetary observation. We participate in a belief that because of the multiplication of eyes to observe, <coughs> we can see always and everywhere. And one example of a kind of set of images that support this imaginary is that of the blue marble, which were a series of images of the Earth uh, from space, the first of which 
is a photographic view of the Earth as seen by the Apollo 17 crew traveling towards the moon and ends in a 2012 vision which is produced through satellite imagery. Uh, Laura Kurgan's written about them. She uh, points out that the 2012 version is assembled from data collected by the Visible Infrared Imager Radiometer Suite on the Suomi NPP satellite in six orbits over eight hours. And the versions she's making clear aren't simply photographs taken by a person traveling in space with a camera, they're composites of massive quantities of remotely sensed data collected by satellite-borne sensors. And what emerges in these images is an integrating vision, a composite vision, not just double blind vision, a composite vision um, of something no human could see uh, with his or her own eyes. Um, and it's a full 360 degree composite made of data collected and assembled over time, <coughs> wrapped around this wireframe sphere to produce a view of the Earth, which is supposedly true at a resolution of at least half a kilometre per pixel. So, one of the things I find interesting about this image is that as a composite, it has no visible edges to its scene. As a hypothesis of sight, it has no visible edges. It appears it doesn't have boundaries, that it is boundless. And of course, that's where I return to the plane that disappeared. Because the plane that disappeared is a problem for this cultural imaginary in that it appears to demonstrate that we cannot see always and everywhere even when aided by this huge technical complex of GPS, civilian and military satellites, drone cameras, Google Map, and so on. Its disappearance, the plane's disappearance, reveals that there are edges that operate in the surface of visualization, even if we don't always know where they are or how they operate, where or when we might fall off or over these edges. Not surprisingly, and as was discussed earlier, there were many attempts to track the plane and they sought to introduce or identify their own boundaries, edges, corridors, targets, in new hypotheses of sight. There were many such hypotheses, many and various, and we saw some of them earlier, and I'm certainly not going to try and analyze in each, each and every one that appeared because, in fact, they do continue to appear. But I have an extract from a Wikipedia account of the search that was produced quite soon after the plane disappears. And this account, you could see Wikipedia as itself a kind of composite eye here, putting together a whole variety of different observations of um, the, the search. And I'll just point out the things that have been pointed out before. It starts with the Malaysian government, involves the five power defense arrangements, moves on to the China Meteorological Administration, the International Charter, 15 member organization, another 11 countries join the search efforts. Numerous, numerous ships, submarines, planes are involved. Still, we, we don't know how, why the plane disappeared, let alone where. This is a further quote from Wikipedia, which gives information about the practice of information sharing between the actors, between the eyes involved here. It, I suggest that because of regional conflicts, there were genuine trust issues involved in cooperation. A Chinese academic made the observation that the parties were searching independently, thus it was not a multilateral search effort. Um, Malaysia had initially declined to release raw data from its military radar, deeming the information too sensitive, although it later exceeded. 
Defence experts suggest that giving others access to radar information could be sensitive on a military level. They give one example. The rate at which they can take the picture can also reveal how good the radar system is. Another expert suggested that some countries could have had radar data on the aircraft but were reluctant to share the information because that would reveal their own defence capabilities and compromise their own security. Similarly, submarines patrolling the South China Sea might have information, but revealing that information would reveal their location and their listening capabilities. So this is an argument that says we need to think about this failure of trust. And I want to suggest that it's both a cause and a consequence of the emergence of what in uh, Nicholas Luhmann, Luhmannian terms, is a distinction, a hierarchical distinction, between first and second order observation. And that this, the, the, the operation of this distinction between first and second order observation is linked to the operation of a double bind. The title of my paper, Double Blind, and double bind. I've just explained though, before I move into that, in Luhmannian terms, a first order observer observes things. A second order observer observes observation. So you're looking at the observer observing. That's the introduction of the hierarchy. The double bind is a phenomenon described by the anthropologist, fellow contributor to cybernetics, analyst of schizophrenia, and advocate of Alcoholics Anonymous, Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson suggests that the double bind is a characteristic of all adaptive change. Such change, he says, depends upon feedback loops. This is a quote from him, be it those provided by natural selection or those of individual reinforcement. He continues, in all cases, there must be a process of trial and error, the process hypotheses of sight, trial and error, and a mechanism of comparison. But, he further continues, trial and error must always involve error, and error is always biologically <coughs> and or psychically <coughs> expensive. It follows, therefore, that adaptive change must always be hierarchic. We can only reduce our error if we observe our observation. And to do that, we have to introduce this hierarchical distinction between first <coughs> and second order observation. The feedback loops between them are what introduce complications between first and second order of observation. What does second order observation reveal in order to help first order observation? The information from first order observation, how is that used to understand how the, observe, the observation is being conducted? That isn't a simple, circuitous, kind of complete process. So in the case of the disappearing plane, I suggest there is a double bind in operation. The state actors at least, um, there is the coexistence of the injunction to see everything, or at least to not see what they don't see, with a contradictory introduction, injunction, which is to see nothing, which is to say, do not see what you do see. In order for this imaginary of total planetary observation to be preserved, different observers would have had to have revealed to each other what they had seen. And with that would come the possibility of comparison of the capacity to observe. And as Bateson says, that comparison can be very expensive. Expensive. <laughs> Well, he does use the term expensive, that was the word he used. It can cost you, it can cost you the revelation of your defence capabilities, for example. 
So what I'm suggesting was an operation in relation to um, the, the disappearing plane uh, is both double blind <coughs> and double find. A situation in which observers simultaneously feel compelled to observe the, junk, the injunction to see what they do not see and to not see what they do see. So there's a kind of slow dance of observe and tell or don't tell, the outcome of which is these, the creation of these unstable hierarchies through the operation of multiple feedback loops, uh, which make um, and introduce a variety, a whole range, as we see here, of full lines, edges, and limits, boundaries in the surface of visualization. Okay, so the argument, if I try and sum up here, is that there's a kind of hierarchy of first and second order of observation, which emerges out of many different combinations <coughs> of seeing and not seeing. Uh, so it's not only you may not see what you do not see, you may not see what you see, and you may also see what you do not see, and so on. The feedback loops between first and second or order observation are, as Bateson himself says, all too often superposing and interconnecting. But we can't put all these lines, edges, limits, boundaries, borders in the same space. Uh, yeah. And this, I suggest, is what in a sense produces a whole variety of affective disorders of visualization, of paranoia, of narcissism, and despair, as well, of course, as of hope, the hope that we do not see what we do not see does in fact mean that we do see everything. Okay, so that's one possible ending. I could end there. There we are. That explains how that process of trying to find the disappearing plane um, kind of happened. How a plane could disappear, uh, rather than, as the earlier paper, how we couldn't find it, <laughs> but how it could disappear. But I want to go a bit further and ask what then about the status of my own observation? What am I seeing? And from what order of observation am I seeing? I can say that, as a sociologist, uh, I can observe that the invisibility of the plane to observation, and specifically its invisibility is disappearing, that invisibility brings into visibility some of the technical supports necessary for observation, material, technical, political, and otherwise, providing the possibility of piecing together knowledge about the organization of the surface of visualization in relation to, among other matters of sociological and political concern, issues of international security and current technological capacity to observe and I'm so pleased I had this slide in already, to observe, um, for example, underwater. Uh, kind of what, what does it mean there? So what I'm saying is the sociologists can begin to map the surface of visualization in their own way, drawing on accounts to suggest, for example, the plane was first described as having disappeared when it crossed the, the edge of the Malaysian and Vietnamese airspace, that civilian radar provided different information to that recorded by military radar, that tracking by a satellite can provide information, pings, that a change in direction had occurred, but that it takes a very long time to work out uh, which direction uh, that would be. And I have that diagram again. Much less clearly visible, but still observable, or at least observable by being rendered unobservable in specific ways, are the political dimensions which mean that the information gained 
by, first, by both first and second order observation is only made available in limited ways. So what I as a sociologist can observe is that the plane's possible movements become variously visible or invisible in relation to different technologies of observation, different orders of political and military reach. Uh, and that what I can conclude, which I did, the surface of visualization, although it appears to be a seamless, boundaryless, 360 degree composite, <laughs> is in fact a military, political, technical patchwork, a ceaselessly ongoing work of comp composition. I can go a little bit further <laughs> as a sociologist, and I can put that finding together with studies of other kinds of non-observability. You remember, I think disappearance is a specific kind of non-observability. Another kind of non-observability is state secrecy. And thinking about what is visible and invisible in this surface of in, uh, visualization, I can look at the work of others, for example, the work of Peter Gallison, who's pointed out that a new targetable infrastructure has both come into view in recent years and been rendered a matter of secrecy. He says, with the terror wars raging across the globe, Sites previously invisible to the targeters, passenger trains, shopping centres, sports stadiums, monuments, suddenly came all too clearly into view. And he suggests that it's this targetable infrastructure that informs the contemporary organisation of state secrecy in the USA. He has a very nice um, historical analysis uh, of, of this. Um, and the thing I would draw your attention to here is in the middle of the paragraph where he's looking at the extension of uh, state secrecy in relation to issues of national security. And he's looking at the additions that were made in response to transnational terrorism. Uh, he said, the government would seek as well protection to cover vulnerabilities or capabilities of systems installations, infrastructure, projects, plans, or protection services related to the national security. And he continues, with this new vocabulary, specifically in the inclusion of infrastructure, uh, we see a sea change in the ontology of secrecy. He, and he points out that Bush framed the national strategy with a picture of the opposition. The terrorist enemy that we face is highly determined, patient, and adaptive. For me, this is a key way of beginning to think about is the way in which a kind of global social order is being produced is in terms of understandings of adaptive change and the importance of looking at a notion of adaptive change. And I think that's interesting as well in relation to the early, some of the earlier papers where we were talking about the natural, social, the, the human, non-human border. Um, that adaptive change is in fact an understanding of change that can work across both the natural uh, and social worlds. Gallison concludes, our new security fences everywhere, not delimited by time and space, um, critical unclassified information fits our age exactly as a form of secrecy with no end date, no limit of scope, and little access through the Freedom of Information Act. In short, we have a new ontology of hidden knowledge. Multiply infinite secrets for a boundless conflict. So what he's saying in my terms here is that the composite form of composition identified uh, in, by Kurgan and others uh, allows for a kind of multiplication of secrets, a multiplication of forms of visible invisibilities, invisible visibilities, which provide the grounds or topological territories for, in his terms, conflict without end. 
not total planetary observation, but total war. That's another possible end. Could end there. I need to see whether. I, I could, just five more minutes. Yeah? Okay. But, so now I'm reflecting on reflecting. I'm observing my own observation. I'm taking the problem of the differentiation of first and second order observation as my problem. But in doing so, am I just introducing my own feedback loop, my own hierarchy, in order to secure the legitimacy of my own operations of observation? In much methodological composition, uh, much methodological discussion, and I really think those issues of methodology are key, in much methodological discussion, some form of reflexivity is advocated to avoid the solipsism of reflection in which the researcher sees only him or herself, his or her own prejudices or concerns. Reflexivity, in contrast, is held to allow the researcher to avoid such narcissism by involving the researcher in considering the ground or context of the object, identifying the conditions of possibility as a way of establishing critical distance between subject and object. But can we do that in a topological space? Can we identify the grounds the context in which our problem emerges? Can we step outside that ground or context? And if we can't, what can we do? I would want to suggest, in the place of that kind of mode of reflexivity, uh, in which we don't assume that we can find a total context, identify a total context that would explain everything, or everything about our problem. But we need to think about the ways in which we can't reconcile the many contexts in which observation takes place. That we can't establish fixed orders of observation and instead, we might need to take seriously the call by the programmer and artist, Dimitri Kleiner, who suggests that we should engage in the production of social fictions. Social fictions. And he introduces this term in contrast to science fiction. He says, in science fiction, uh, historical changes are imagined through speculative future technologies. Technologies that don't yet exist, we imagine them. Uh, but he suggests that in social fiction, the technologies already exist, but society is speculative or missing. So this would be to suggest in the case of the disappearing or missing plane, that the reason that the plane is missing is that a society in which it could be seen is missing. And it's an argument that suggests that reflexivity has got to involve a kind of deconstructive moment, but a reconstructive moment. And we've had examples of that where people have talked about the different kinds of alliances, collaborations that are produced. We've also heard people talking about the ways in which the problems, the dilemmas, are moving from local to global, global to local. That we can't do that through various forms of universalization, that maybe we need to think about society as missing in terms of partial wholes, more than one unity, more, and not a totality. And that that would require thinking about border concepts in very specific ways, <coughs> to think about the work of bordering in our own practice, uh, in terms of what we do, um, what we put our energies uh, into. 
that's another possible ending, and it's really the end of my paper. Um, well, there were a few others, but we won't do those. This is just to refer you to this work, which probably many of you know, um, which is a work by the artist Hito Steyl, which is called How Not to Be Seen, a fucking didactic <laughs> educational move. And I, I like this one because it takes uh, as its site the photo calibration targets which were constructed in the 1950s and 60s in Californian deserts to test the resolution of airborne cameras and drones. Uh, and most of them follow this same kind of layout that you can see on the left there. And then I inserted, some of you who grew up a long time in the UK may remember this, um, the test card, which was on British television uh, for a long time when we didn't have 24 hour television, which was about testing the resolution of the image. Uh, they're both, as it were, test sites for a surface of visualization. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that uh, this work is set there. Um, and I wish I had the link for you, but it, because it's very funny, uh, and I recommend that you um, watch it, um, she, because she gives you all sorts of ways in which you can not be seen. Uh, and some of them are voluntary, and some of them are involuntary. Some of them, there's, there's just things that you can't change. So that to be a woman um, over 50 means apparently uh, you're visible, you're invisible. Um, you can also become invisible, she says, by being poor or undocumented, although we've also seen that is a way of making yourself hyper-visible in other ways. So I think I just want to end with this as a kind of intervention in looking at this uh, relationship between visibility and invisibility and how it's organized in a surface of visualization that has specific capacities, a surface of potential that allows boundaries, hypotheses of insight to be drawn in very specific ways. And the movie ends, these digitally rendered ghosts dance in the desert landscape as the three degrees, when will I see you again, plays on the soundtrack. So that's my... That is my end, <laughs> the real end.